Hey there, this is Jacob from RoboFlow, here today to show you how to train YOLOS on your own custom dataset. So why is YOLOS so exciting? YOLOS is a new transformer model that has been taught to do object detection similar to previous YOLO models. But unlike previous YOLO models, YOLOS rests on a vision transformer encoder, which is um, the new state-of-the-art model that has been sweeping through the NLP world and is now being applied to vision models. So the YOLOS uh, model architecture actually takes patches of images. So it takes 16 by 16 patch of your image and pass that through the normal transformer encoder and then makes box predictions. So unlike other YOLO models, this doesn't have uh, multiple heads to make detections at different uh, varying levels and then having, having a lot of NMS after, afterwards. It just passes right through and you get all of your class and box predictions. Uh, you get up to 100 of them. That's the way that uh, YOLOS works. So, uh, we're going to dive in today, and we're, we're going to go in, and we're going to actually train YOLOS on a custom data set, and this is going to be really exciting. And, and, and today, I'm going to show you guys how to do that with uh, four main technologies. So the first will be RoboFlow to gather our data set and to you know, create uh, versions of our data and, and label it to, to train the model. And then we'll use the YOLOS model as it's implemented in Hugging Face Transformers. Uh, and this, this is really exciting because now this means that YOLOS is a lot more tractable to use and, and a lot more portable, too, as we'll see. Uh, we'll visualize our training in weights and biases, which is uh, a new uh, machine learning tool to visualize, uh, you know, your, your training results and, and, and iterate on your experiments. And then we'll deploy our model on AWS SageMaker, which is one of the best places in the game now to uh, deploy and serve your model. So once your model is trained, you need to put it somewhere where you can infer against it. So if you want to do cloud uh, deployments of your models, AWS is a very good place uh, to be doing that. And SageMaker serverless potentially makes it the easiest as, as it is in the game. And so this is a technical tutorial, so we're going to actually do all of these, these things right now, and I'm going to go ahead and dive right into the Colab Notebook, which this will be linked in the video as well. So this is the uh, How to Train YellowS Notebook. So the first thing you do is you install the technologies that we're going to use in Python. And here uh, I've, I've commented out my keys, but you also want to put these in here so you can log into the different things that we're using. So you'll need your AWS key, which you can find in your AWS dashboard. You'll need your RoboFlow key, which you can find in your RoboFlow dash dashboard in your workspace. Um, and then also uh, you'll log in to weights and biases. So that, that's as simple as making an account on their, their web app, and then you now you have access to the weights and biases logging. Uh, and so once you have uh, your RoboFlow key, uh, you can use it here to download this data set, or you really, if you want to be training your own custom detector, you should be uploading your data up into RoboFlow and then annotating it there. Uh, but here you can see this version of blood cell detection, and I'll show you how I have it in the RoboFlow platform now. So here you can see uh, my data set, and uh, you can see all the images. So this is being trained to recognize white blood cells, red blood cells, and uh, platelets in, in the bloodstream. But you could be doing this anywhere if you have aerial imagery or if you have uh, microscopic imagery or if you have normal real world imagery, like just scenes like this or infrared or, or whatever kind of imagery you have, you can bring it in here to be training the model in to uh, detect the objects in the domain that you're, you're seeking to teach it. Um, but yeah, this is a little bit what this data set looks like, and then we'll be exporting this data set uh, out of RoboFlow and then into the notebook. Uh, so here we can see we generated versions, and this is where you can work on your images. You can do pre-processing standardizations or augmentations to create more variations of your data, and, and that's very valuable for a model like YellowS that doesn't have an augmentation pipeline already built into it online. Um, so this is uh, a useful tool to boost some of the performance of your model. And then, uh, so you export the data set here, and we see that the zip came down, and we can see where the data set location is. So this is where you can go, and if you want to see the files and you want to go through and uh, see what the data set looks like, you can, you can do it there. Uh, next, we'll register our data set in TorchVision. So this is uh, a lot of kind of like boilerplate PyTorch code, but uh, it's, it's good to look into if you, if you want to read it a little bit more carefully when you crack the notebook open. And then, uh, as usual, we should definitely look at our image after it's loaded into PyTorch to make sure that it looks good, you know, and make sure that, you know, everything uh, worked through the pipeline. Uh, you know, if this, this step didn't work, then there was maybe some problem above where uh, there was some uh, exportation issue. And, and the nice thing about RoboFlow, though, is that we manage all these formats uh, for you. So we did export uh, our data set in Cocoa format. I didn't mention that. Uh, but it's very important to choose Cocoa format to uh, load your data set into this model. Um, and so then uh, we'll go ahead and create our data loaders. And after that, we'll set up the training configuration. So this all comes from the YOLOS model 
uh, that Niels at Hugging Face did an excellent job of implementing and has a lot of details here. So if you want to dive further into this, uh, I highly recommend uh, diving into these documents. And I'll share these in, in the video below and you can learn more about the, the OS model, how it's implemented, and the different things that uh, Hugging Face has coded around it to make it easier to use. Um, so that, that's pretty exciting. Um, and then, of course, I'll also be linking the paper if you want to then go one level uh, under and keep, keep going down and learning more about where uh, the research came from. And so here we implement this and we'll wrap this model in a PyTorch Lightning uh, uh, training module. So this will make our, our training loops a little bit more, more simple. Uh, again, I recommend uh, diving into the notebook and checking that out in more detail. Essentially, we're setting up the network architecture so when we pass data through it, we can iterate through epochs of our data to then train the model, to teach the model by uh, backpropagating through its weights that are defined in, in the network architecture. We'll backpropagate through those to uh, teach our model uh, to model the data set in the same way that we labeled it. So it's important to label it well because uh, you know that your model is only as good as the data that you feed it. That's an important thing to remember with all these models. Uh, so here we go ahead and we initialize the, the Detter model and we can see that we downloaded the weights there uh, from Hugging Face um, to be able to load the model into memory. And then here uh, we're going to uh, do a few little logging tendrils into our training process with weights and biases. This means that uh, with weights and biases we can visualize the training as it's happening so we can have a little more insight into the process that the model is being trained. And then in this cell we go ahead and kick off training. So this uses the PyTorch Lightning Trainer that we initialized to load our model into memory and then just cycle through our model to be fitting that model to model the data set that we fed it. And uh, this, this part is, um, you know, going to take a little while. So uh, we're training it here for 50 epochs. You know, you can train just for a few epochs and then it will be uh, a little bit less accurate. But otherwise, uh, you can crank this all the way up uh, and, uh, you know, your model will fit better. And the, the other nice thing about the model to know is that uh, you can save the, the best version of it as it's training and then you can stop there. So even if you, uh, you know, go massively over in, in epics, you can be kind of saving the checkpoint at the, the spot that is best fit. And so as this is training, we can jump over into our uh, weights and biases uh, project and we'll, we can see, you know, a project running um, as it's cycling through through epochs and we can also see all the stats about uh, the loss and stuff as it's getting logged and this is a good way to if you have a project where you've done like a lot of experiments you can see them in comparison I think I have them in this this project but we'll see if it loads um, so yeah so you can kind of see you can compare your training losses and your validation losses obviously here the most important metric to be watching here is your validation loss the model that gets the lowest val validation loss is probably going to be your best one uh, but we'll see here in the notebook that we also have some uh, other more detailed validation that we do with the COCA detection API, which is usually what people benchmark their, uh, their models on. So diving into that part, I've already run these cells so we can kind of imagine that uh, they're running as our model is training. Um, first, we'll like just kind of clear our torch cache to make sure that we don't have any of our network tensors left in memory, so clear that out and then we'll start doing the uh, eval. If you don't do that step, sometimes your Colab GPU will, will blow up. So. Uh, it's always good to uh, clear, clear, your, clear your cache and uh, maybe there's something in uh, PyTorch Lightning team would tell me I'm doing wrong or Hugging Face would tell me I'm doing wrong, but uh, otherwise you, you can just <laughs> clear your Torch cache. Uh, and then we clone uh, the Detcher repo, which is another transformer uh, detector but that preceded uh, Yellow S. And we use that, uh, that Coco Evaluate function there to evaluate our model. And this is where you start to look at how well your model is doing across different classes. So you can see all the different uh, evals as you're going through. You know, uh, what's your MAP uh, score, which is a measure of how well your predicted boxes are gonna be uh, lining up with your, uh, with your ground truth boxes. And obviously the higher the better. And uh, then you can save that final summary metric uh, to weights and biases, which is kind of nice. Um, the next step in the notebook is to then visualize your inference on test images. So again, I'm kind of running through this as if I was uh, training uh, the model, uh, but training is going to take a little while for this complete, so I'll just run through it as if, as if we were executing these cells. 
Um, and in this part, you uh, take uh, like an example uh, image from the validation set, and you just take a look at that to see how is my inference doing. You know, here, this is a model that's been trained for 50 epochs, could have been trained for a little bit longer, uh, but it's doing a pretty good job of identifying the uh, red blood cells that are in this image. Uh, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. I guess there's not a platelet uh, present in this image. Maybe you could argue that this one is uh, kind of one on the side. Maybe that's something to uh, show your model later to, to teach it again to model your data better. Um, and then lastly, we kind of hit our finishing route over to weights and biases. And you can see that all these reports are generated. And this can be really useful if you're continuing to come through this process to continue to look at your experiments uh, again and again. Um, so now for the last step, this is probably the best part. And uh, this part, I have to give credit to Mark McQuaid at RoboFlow for uh, coming up with this, this, uh, this part of the notebook. But this is some of the most powerful uh, leverage of machine learning technology today. We're going to be deploying the state-of-the-art Yellow S transformer all the way up to SageMaker serverless, so we don't even have to worry about scaling our compute. That means that you can serve this model, now that you've trained, as many times as you want in your application wherever you want to take it, just with SageMaker Serverless. So uh, in, in order to do this, uh, before I, I, I showed, uh, showed you to log into the AWS CLI, make sure that you've done that. And you can look in the SageMaker uh, list roles for your SageMaker execution role. And then uh, if you don't have one of those, you might need to make one. Um, but anyways, specify that service role here. And then we will bundle up our code. So this is where we put it all into uh, the configuration that the SageMaker uh, serverless configuration is going to be looking for. And um, this is uh, sort of like an area of technology that Hugging Face and SageMaker have been working very closely together to create a seamless integration for deploying models like this. And so you get to like kind of abstract away a lot of really hard stuff about managing Docker and scaling Docker and scaling um, you know, machine learning instances. Um, this, this isn't on GPU yet, but that's probably on the roadmap, so it's a good thing to, to build on if you're then kind of uh, preparing to do that, that sort of thing later. Um, so we package up the code, and then we put the code up onto uh, an S3 bucket. And then from that S3 bucket, we download it over into uh, SageMaker serverless. And this will spin our code in our model. It spins it up on an instance for you, or a, rather a set of instances if you have a lot of requests coming at it which puts your model up into memory on those servers, and then uh, you can just run inference and then get predictions back as, as it's going. So it abstracts a lot of things uh, about uh, you know, uh, cloud and servers for you. And, and then you publish it onto uh, you know, a serverless inference configuration here. And once it's on the serverless con uh, configuration and, and it publishes after the cell executes, you can then log into your AWS dashboard and you can see the logs uh, of your model. Um, I don't have my dashboard up right here, but you can read more about SageMaker um, on uh, this blog and, and go and check it out and check out the dashboards. But like, this is very useful, right? Because now you know when uh, you know you know when your model fails. You know what certain things are being logged. You know if like the compute is going down, um, and then you get uh, the whole SageMaker ecosystem. Uh, to then, you know, watch as they, they build new things and they, they deploy new things. So this is a really exciting place uh, to be learning and, and uh, you know, working on deploying your models. Um, so yeah, so, so it should take a few moments to put it up there, which makes sense because you're uploading a large model up into the cloud. And then you have an endpoint that you can predict at. And this SageMaker uh, SDK here wraps that endpoint, but you can always remember that you can go up on SageMaker, you can see the endpoint, and if you want to hit it through different uh, application interfaces, like wherever you're coding, um, you know, maybe you're maybe you're a Node developer, or maybe you're, I don't know, maybe you're coding in GoLang or Rust or something. But you can hit it. Uh, the, the, you have this endpoint that you can use for whatever you want and post images at it. Um, and then lastly, here I did want to point out that as you're starting to notice, you know, your model might not be behaving exactly as you you expected. You should add more variation to your data set. It's always good to be eating your vegetables and uploading. Uh, new and better data to your model and retraining again. And uh, here we have a, an example of the same RoboFlow project that we downloaded our data set from. We can then upload data back up into RoboFlow. And there you can be labeling again, changing things. You can be using RoboFlow Label Assist. Uh, if you train a model in RoboFlow, you can use RoboFlow Label Assist to then uh, be able to uh, kind of auto-label your bounding boxes and continuing to iterate on your data set there. 
Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty much everything for our tutorial today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching and happy inference and uh, happy training. And we'll see you in the next video. If you really like this video, please like and subscribe below. And uh, until then.